Well, thank you, music team, for leading us in worship and song this morning. It is good to be with God's people, and it is good to gather together to worship his name. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes chapter 5. The search for satisfaction is alive and well today. Everyone is searching for a way to be happy, aren't they? They're searching for a way to be joyful or content or to to find fulfillment in life. Call it whatever you want, whatever term you want to throw on it. Everyone is searching for satisfaction. Um, But as the Rolling Stones so famously put it in 1964, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. I try and I try and I try and I try, but I can't get no satisfaction. We search, but we can't find. We look, but we can't attain. We can't achieve. We can't grab onto satisfaction. Some search for satisfaction in people, in relationships, in this sense of feeling loved and welcomed by others. Uh, Some search for satisfaction in work, job, uh, this sense of of feeling accomplished, doing something, showing something for my efforts. The question for us is, where should we search for satisfaction? And in our passage this morning, Solomon answers that question. He tells us where we should look, and he tells us where we should not look. So as I read Ecclesiastes 5 verses 8, and we're going to read into chapter 6. As I read, see if you can identify the source of satisfaction that Solomon gives us here. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. This is what Holy Scripture says to us today. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched over by a higher And there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, And shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things and, all, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, 
It has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the, to the one place? All the toil of a man is for his mouth, yet he, his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool, and what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please bow your heads with me uh, one more time as we go to God in prayer. Father, we ask for your help now as we come to your word. We have read a longer passage, one that can be challenging to understand. And so we ask that you would give us clarity of thought, wisdom, and understanding. We pray that you would convict us of the truth that we read in these words. We pray that you would work in our hearts and help us to be more like Jesus. Lord, we ask for the children downstairs as well that you would encourage them that through their teachers, through their time of study of your word, that you would open up their hearts to see the truth of the gospel. They would, they would come to love Jesus and that they would seek to follow after him. Lord, help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As we saw last week, in the beginning part of chapter 5, we saw Solomon give us a serious warning. He said, prepare yourself before you come into God's presence. Speak less and speak carefully. Be prepared. Why? Because God is high and because God is holy. He is transcendent and he is righteous. Therefore, you can't just walk in however you want and be however you want, talk however you want in God's presence. Solomon exhorted us to, to not be reckless, to not be hasty with our words. He said, pay what you vow. Use your words and mean your words. Don't make excuses and try to back out of your promises. The question would then be, why, what would drive somebody to do this? What would drive somebody to make a promise, to say something before God, to be reckless with their words, but then keep back what they promised to God? What would make somebody do that in the first place? The answer to that is, of course, greed. Why would somebody promise to give away something, to do something, and then keep it back for themselves? Greed is this selfish desire to keep for self. And this is what Solomon now turns to in, in our passage. He talks about the greedy that hoard all their stuff, that amass a great wealth, that, that collect many riches, many great things, in an attempt specifically to satisfy their souls. But Solomon gives us three reasons why we shouldn't do this. Three reasons to keep ourselves from the love of money. Three reasons why we should not search for satisfaction in riches. And the first reason to keep ourselves from the love of money is, number one, the love of money is an empty love. It is ultimately unsatisfactory. It's undoubtedly disappointing. No matter what you do, no matter how much you get, you will always be unsatisfied with your wealth. The love of money is an itch that can never be scratched. Look at verse 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. Solomon describes oppression. He's already talked about that theme before, but he, he looks out at oppression and he sees that people are oppressed by those that are greedy, the officials that want more, that are oppressing the poor to keep them poor so that they might steal their wealth. The Officials, these higher officials, they love money and they're willing to do anything to get more of it. Even the king, the king who, in our minds, and realistically so, w would have everything, right? They've got everything at their fingertips. They've got whatever they want. And what do we see? Even the king who has everything, he wants more. He's unsatisfied with what he has and he takes more from the field. He's committed to, he's served by, he's taking from this cultivated field even if it doesn't belong to him. In other words, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. 
Solomon says the same thing at the very end of the section. If you look down in chapter 6, verse 7, all the toil of a man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool, and what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. This love of money is an appetite. It's a a stomach that can't be filled. Uh, We eat our food and we're satisfied. We're filled, right? Uh, But only for a little bit, right? You had breakfast this morning. How many of you are already hungry? You were were full this morning because you had bacon and eggs or cereal and toast and whatever you had. And yet this appetite that you have, this, this stomach that you have, it continually wants more. Eventually the hunger sets in again. Our appetite is never truly satisfied. And that's exactly what Solomon says, our appetite for riches. That's exactly what they are like. Our love of money. Those that love money will never have enough. Whether they're wise or foolish. What advantage does the wise have over the fool? Well, if he loves money, he's got no advantage. He still has this stomach that always needs to be filled. Whether rich or poor. Whether the rich or the poor. Whether he knows how to live or whether he doesn't. If he loves money, he will always want more of it. Those that love money are never satisfied with it. That's reason number one. The love of money is an empty love. It cannot satisfy. Therefore, don't search for satisfaction in riches, in money, in wealth. But there's another reason to stay away from the love of money. The second reason to keep ourselves from the love of money is this. Number two, the love of money is a a tragic love. It is a tragic, it's, it's contemptible lamentable. You know that uh, book in the Bible, Lamentations? I mean, not many of us use the word lament anymore. Woe is me. Oh no, sorrowful, sadness, discouragement. Solomon says that the love of money is a tragic love. It it makes you worthy of of great pity. Look in chapter 6, verse 3. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it, that is this stillborn child, comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place. This man that Solomon is describing here, he has it all. He has everything. He has wealth. He has power. He has riches. He has honor. We read that in verse 2. But what's his problem? He can't enjoy any of it. He has everything, and yet he's unsatisfied with what he has. He's not satisfied even though he has a hundred children. Some of you may be overwhelmed with like two or three kids. This guy has a hundred. Children were, were a sign of blessing. We're a great sign of, of blessing from God. This guy has not just some blessings. Abraham had one son and then another, and he was blessed by God. This guy has a hundred. He has like the greatest blessing he could ever ask for, and yet he's unsatisfied with it. He's not satisfied even though he lives a thousand years twice over. How many years is that? Two thousand years. I'll give you the answer. I know it's early in the morning. It's hard to do math. It's, it's, a, it's an exaggeration, exaggerated idea. Like nobody lives 2,000 years old. And yet this guy, even if he lived 2,000 years, he could do everything. He could see everything. One of the greatest regrets people sometimes have at the end of their lives is they didn't get to travel and, and see as much of the world as they had wanted to see. This guy's lived 2,000 years. He could see whatever he want, wanted to. He could go do whatever he wanted to do. And yet he's unsatisfied with even that ability. He's not satisfied with these great blessings from God. And as such, they're then wasted on him. God has given him much, and yet he doesn't care. And Solomon says he's actually worse, worse off than a, a stillborn child. A child that, that dies in the womb, that does not make it from womb into life. He describes this child as having no reputation, right? Its name is covered in darkness. Name, reputation, it, it has no significance in the world. 
Why? Because it never actually made it into the world. It has no experience of life. He says it, has, it hasn't seen life under the sun. It hasn't done anything. It hasn't been anywhere. It has no, no name or reputation. But this life, which really isn't much of a life at all, Solomon says this life of a stillborn child, its existence is more preferable to those that love riches. Why? Well, he says very clearly because it actually finds rest. It finds contentment. It finds a a peace and a quietness that the greedy just cannot possess. The love of money is a, a tragic love. The greedy are to be pitied more than a stillborn child. We mourn when a child is lost in the womb. We grieve. We're filled with sorrow and sadness. And Solomon says that take that sadness and multiply it. That's what we should have towards those that love money. That type of pity, that type of sorrow and sadness. The greedy are to be pitied more than a stillborn child because the love of money is a tragic love but there's a third reason to keep ourselves from the love of money it is a tragic love it is an unsatisfactory love it's an empty love and number three the love of money is a costly love it is a costly love it's it's a disastrous and dangerous love because of what it costs the cost of loving money is high it is It's expensive to love money. It comes at a great expense. Sometimes the cost is financial. Look at chapter 5, verse 11. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? A little bit of an awkward phrasing in English. What's Solomon saying? They increase who eat them. That is, the more riches you have, the more people you have who want to leech off of your wealth. Could be talking about leeches in the sense of those that just want to piggyback off. They want to be your friend because you have stuff. It might be talking about um, taxes. That is, the more you make, the more you have, the higher tax bracket you have, the more taxes you have to pay. Or it might simply be talking about the, the natural expenses of financial growth. Some of you are involved in the corporate world. And as the business grows, what happens? There are more expenses. Why? Well, because you have to hire more staff and because you take on more clients and because you have bigger buildings and because you have all these other expenses that come along with this amassed wealth. You have to grow with the finances that are growing. Regardless of, of exactly what Solomon's point is, either way, the more you have, the more it will cost you. It costs a lot to be rich. And the cost isn't just financial. There's also a a mental cost that's involved, a stress and a worry that's involved in loving money. Look in verse 12, chapter 5, verse 12. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Now, he's not sleeping because he's got a tummy ache because he ate too much ice cream. The rich lie awake at night. They, they, they are unable to go to bed and sleep because they're worried about their wealth. They're worried about protecting it, keeping it, making sure that it doesn't disappear on them. And they want to keep their stuff so badly. They lie awake at night, and we actually see that they, they hold on to it to the point where it actually hurts them. It, it costs them something. Look in verse 13. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. I heard a story once of a, a woman who, who won a contest. It was a contest to, uh, uh, the prize was a, like a year's supply of, of meat. So steaks and sausages and hamburgers and hot dogs. And I don't know if you've ever gone to Costco and you've seen those big you know, bins of meat. Um, I don't have a freezer that big to kind of fit all of that meat. I don't, I don't have space to put all of that meat, and neither did this woman, and so she uh, went to a friend who had a very big deep freezer, and she put all of the meat into the deep freezer. Uh, the problem is, is that she didn't trust her friend. She was so worried about losing her amassed wealth 
that she ended up spying on her friend with binoculars through the window, and every time they saw, she saw the barbecue going, she was you know, tr- making sure that's not mine, is it? And she, she just became so worried about protecting her, her wealth that it actually ruined her. It ruined her mentally. Like her sanity just started to slip because she was so worried about losing. It ruined her relationship with that friend. It it cost that relationship because she she no longer trusted her friend and her friend just became annoyed and really wanted nothing to do with her. And it also destroyed her reputation. People thought she was nuts. The love of money hurts us in ways that we don't even really see or understand in the moment. It damages us. It destroys us in so many ways, which is sad. It's a grievous evil, Solomon says. It's a, that word grievous, it it has this idea of of being sick to the stomach. It makes me so sick to think about how damaging the love of money is. It's a sickening tragedy, especially since there's nothing we can do to keep our riches. All our riches can be lost in an instant. Sometimes our riches are lost through through bad ventures, through poor investments. Look in verse 13, chapter five, verse 13. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. Lost in an instant, just like that. Poor investment, bad venture, bad idea. He put all of his money, all of his eggs into one basket, and that basket was stolen, or the basket was destroyed, and all of a sudden, it's gone. And what does he have? He has nothing. He has a son, but he's unable to care for his son. He can't feed his son. He can't clothe his son because he has nothing. He has no inheritance anymore either. He can't pass anything down when he's gone. His riches are lost in an instant through bad ventures. Sometimes riches are lost not because of a a dumb decision that we've made or a poor decision. Sometimes riches are lost simply because we die. Look at verse 15. And he came from his mother's womb. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again. Naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil, a sickening tragedy. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? You come into the world naked. Literally, but but also tangibly. You have nothing to your name. You have no money. You have no clothes. You have nothing. You, you come into the world with nothing. And that's exactly how you leave the world. You leave the world empty-handed. You, you don't take anything with you. No, you take your soul. You, you take your conscience. And you go stand before the Creator. But you don't take any of this stuff that you so easily try to hang on to. Your wealth is lost in the instant of death. All those years that you spent building and amassing and acquiring your wealth, it's gone. The love of money is costly because it can all be gone in an instant. And that reality, this reality of I love money, but I know I'm going to lose it, so I'm going to lie awake at night and do what I can to keep it, it drives people insane and destroys them, it hurts them, and ultimately it drives people to loneliness and depression. Look in verse 17. Moreover, all his days, he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. The illustration that came to my mind as I was reflecting on this was Ebenezer Scrooge. Remember Ebenezer Scrooge from A Christmas Carol? What was his love? Money. Did he have any friends? No. Did he have any excitement? No. In fact, he lives in his old partner's house with no wood, no coal, no fire because he's trying to save as much money as he can. He's literally in the cold and the dark and the damp. He's rich and greedy, but he's an old, sad miser. He's afraid of losing his wealth and he's alone and paranoid about everything. The love of money is an extremely costly love. The love of money is empty and costly, and it makes you more pitiable than even a stillborn child. So, Solomon says, don't seek to satisfy your soul with riches. Don't do it. Won't work. Won't get you anywhere. 
it'll leave you worse off than if you didn't pursue them at all. So if it's impossible to satisfy our souls with riches, where then do we look? Where do we search? This is where people often look, right? People will often look to things that they can grab onto in this life, the, the empire that they can build under the sun, and they go, this will make me happy, this will make me satisfied. Solomon says no. So where do we look? Well, he says, if we would satisfy our souls, we must ultimately find our satisfaction in God. Solomon says we must satisfy our souls with God and with God alone in a joy that only he can give, in a joy that only he can grant or bestow or gift to us. Look at chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. We, we all acknowledge and we all would admit, at least those of us that read the Bible, believe the Bible, profess the Bible to be God's word, we would all say that God is the giver of gifts. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. It comes from God. Whether whether we follow God or not, every gift comes from Him. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, right? Everything good comes from God. And yet we see that He's not only the one who gives wealth, who gives riches, who gives the money, He is also the one who gives the power to enjoy those things. To some, He gives this power. And as we read in chapter 6, verse 2, to some, He gives the wealth, but He doesn't give that power to enjoy them. The Hebrew word for joy and joy in these verses, it means to, to eat or to feed on. To enjoy something is to be filled with it, to consume it and be satisfied with it. To enjoy something is, isn't just to, to find pleasure in it because the rich have many pleasures. They find those temporary happinesses. That's not a real word. Temporary joys, right? They, they find those temporary things that they go, yeah, I like my car, and I like my boat, and I like my mansion, and I have fun with all these things. But joy in this context isn't talking about having fun with all of these things. To enjoy something in this context to be, means to be satisfied, to be content, to not need anything else. And the only way to enjoy what we have, to be satisfied with what we have, whether little or much, the only way to be content with what we has, have is if our joy, our satisfaction, our contentment is ultimately rooted in God. Look at what he says in verse 20. For he, that is the one that God has given riches to, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Rather than worrying about the past, regretting about the past, mourning over all that was lost or all that could have been or all those things in the past. I could have built this. I could have made this. I could have had all of this stuff. That's what it means to remember the days of his life, to look back on the past and regret what's there, what's been. Solomon says, rather than doing that, there's a joy, there's a satisfaction that can overcome all of those regrets, that can make you not look back on your life and go, oh, woe is me for all the things that I could have had but didn't have in this life. He says there's a joy that overcomes all of that, and that is the joy of the Lord. He says, if God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart, if he is occupied with the joy of God in his heart, do you understand what Solomon is saying here? He's saying that God must satisfy us with himself before we can ever be satisfied with anything else. Is it possible to be content with what you have in this life, whether great or small? Is it possible to be content? Yes, but it's only possible if first we are satisfied with God. The only way to enjoy what we have is if we first enjoy God. We must be satisfied in God if we want to enjoy what we have. The, the problem for us is, is that we don't naturally seek satisfaction in God. We don't naturally look to find our joy, our contentment in God. We pursue joy in everything other than God, don't we? 
We seek satisfaction in, as Jeremiah calls them, broken cisterns, empty wells, giant holes in the ground that are supposed to have great water of life, but they have nothing but dirt and mud and garbage. This is what what sin does to us. It tells us that we don't need God. This goes back all the way to Genesis, right? What was, what was the, the lie that the serpent gave to Adam and Eve? Don't listen to God. You don't need God. In fact, if you eat this fruit, you will be like God and you can be better than God. You don't need him. You don't need joy and satisfaction in God. You just need yourself. It's this idea that God isn't enough, that he can never satisfy. That's what sin does to us. It tells us you can't be satisfied in God. Therefore, if we, if we want our souls to be satisfied, and if we want our souls to be satisfied in God, we must have this problem of sin actually dealt with, removed, taken away. It's the only way to actually find satisfaction in God, which is why Jesus stepped down from his throne on high, which is why, as we saw at the beginning of chapter 5, the high and holy God stepped down. He became imminent. He became close to us. Why? Jesus died and rose again to take away our sin, to deal with this problem. He gave up his life on the cross, as we were singing earlier, so that all who repent and believe might be forgiven of their sins, so that the repentant might have their their sins washed away, cleaned, taken care of, dealt with. Jesus is the only one who can deal with our problem of sin, which is why we must run to him in faith, which is why we we must go to him in faith. Because those that go to him in faith not only find forgiveness of sins, find this problem of sin dealt with, not only do we have a new status, a new standing before God. We were once rebels, we were once sinners, and now we're righteous, now we're holy, now we're called and welcomed into his family. Uh, There's been a, a change of status that took place with God. But that's not the only thing that changes. When we come to faith in Jesus, we find that our desires also change. Our our desires are are renewed. They're restored. Jesus transforms us and and makes us long for satisfaction in him. The psalmist writes in, in Psalm 42, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. How is that possible to long for God, to seek to be satisfied in him? It's when Jesus changes our hearts. It's when we find in faith a forgiveness that that transcends all of our sins. And not only do we long for him, not only do we want to be satisfied in God, we find that in coming to Jesus, our souls are actually satisfied in him. He is actually able to give us what we need. He is actually able to give us that satisfaction, satisfaction for our souls. Jesus will say to the the Samaritan woman, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Solomon reminds us In Ecclesiastes 5 and 6, he reminds us of the dangers of greed, the love of money, wanting more, never being satisfied with things in this life. You will never find satisfaction if your love is money. So don't be greedy for money. Solomon tells us to be greedy for God. That may sound a little weird, like greedy is always bad. To be greedy is simply to never have enough of something, right? To be greedy for money, I want more. I I can never be satisfied. Solomon tells us, be greedy for God. Never get enough of God. Always want more of God. Always want more of Him. We should always want more and more and more and more. And yet, our longing for more is actually satisfied in God. That is, when we want more of God, God gives us more and our stomach is actually filled. Our appetite is actually satisfied. Thank God that he is actually enough. Thank God that his his grace, his mercy, his compassion, his love, his kindness, his goodness, his faithfulness to us, it is actually enough. He is enough for even you. Thank God that he is able to, to truly satisfy our souls, that we don't need to look 
out there. We don't need to look to the world. We don't need to look to our jobs. We don't need to look to relationships. We don't need to look to our our wealth and our money or status or power. We don't need to look to anything else to satisfy our souls because God is enough. May God help us. May he help us to find our satisfaction in him and in him alone. Let's pray. Lord, we confess for many of us, for all of us likely in some sense, Lord, we love our stuff. We love what we have. And we we think in our hearts that all we need is just a little bit more and then we'd be okay. If I had just this one more thing or these few more items, then I'd truly be happy. I'd truly be satisfied. I'd truly have no more complaints or or worries or wants. Lord, help us to hear the, the rebuke of Solomon this morning when he says, it will never be enough. Help us to hear his rebuke and this reminder that you are always enough. Lord, we pray that you would work this truth deep into our hearts. Teach us even as we work and and desire to honor you with what we do in this life. Teach us to be satisfied in you and in you alone. We commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing a closing hymn together? with God to have joy in our lives. Change needs to start in our hearts. Jesus is more than enough for this change. Join us as we sing, Take My Life and Live Me.
Let's pray together. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might or human wisdom's fleeting light, but I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him, no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. Father, this is our prayer today. We ask that you would help us to make this true of our hearts. Help us, we pray, as we go from here to love you, to serve you, and to seek to be faithful to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.